Hello, and welcome back to The Road to 2000. My name is Caleb Denby, and tonight I want to take you through some games from the Legends of Chess final, where Magnus Carlsen just simply cruised to an easy victory. Uh, Magnus, truly a legend of chess, a chess legend, uh, had quite a phenomenal tournament, and really, once he found his stride, there was no turning back, uh, and he really showed it in this final. So, of course, his opponent was Jan Nepomniushi, and we are going to be taking a look at those games that they played, uh, and we're going to see how Magnus just dominated uh, the entire field, including Jan, here tonight. Uh, so to start off with, I wanted to show this game where Magnus had white against Jan. Uh, Jan, throughout the tournament, had been choosing uh, this Grunfeld defense against many of his opponents that had the white pieces, and it had very mixed results for him. Uh, he was getting some really good positions out of the opening, some pretty bad positions, uh, positions that were not so good, but then he managed to turn around, and so it had very much been a back and forth tournament for Jan with the Grunfeld. Uh, we see here, though, that Magnus opts not to go into the true Grunfeld after something like c4, which would allow black to play the move d5, going for the Grunfeld. And instead, Magnus chooses this move, bishop f4. Uh, and so what this means is that black now could play the move d5, and we would be in a very, very standard uh, d4, d5 opening position. However, this actually probably isn't in black's best interest here. Uh, in general, when you go uh, d4, d5, and you have this sort of position, the fianchetto bishop actually isn't going to be the strongest piece in the world. Uh, why is that? Well, it's because white's play is very natural. You go e3, let's say bishop g7, and something like uh, either c4, or just developing normally. Let's go with c4, e6, knight c3, uh, and something like c6, for example. So black has this nice setup where he has built a strong triangle to support this pawn here. Uh, you can imagine these positions with the bishop on f5 as well. And white still has a really solid control over the d4 pawn. Uh, notably, Magnus is not committed to, to something like the London yet with bishop f4. He can still go for these positions with c4. And this is actually going to make this bishop on g7 look a little bit silly, uh, because this d4 pawn is going to be quite strong, quite well defended. Uh, perhaps for those reasons, black still continues with bishop g7, but doesn't opt to go for this uh, symmetrical battle in the center with pawns on d4 and d5. We see e3, king's side castles, bishop e2. Notably, Magnus de Lang choosing where he wants to put this pawn, depending on what black plays. And now we see the move d6. So Jan uh, definitively chooses not to go for this structure with d5, instead opting for the king's Indian structures with d6. Uh, and perhaps uh, part of the reason why he selected this is what I was talking about here, with the bishop not looking great uh, after d4, d5. In the game, we see white castle. And I want to ask you guys in the chat to find some candidate moves here for black. What do you think black should be trying to achieve in this opening? Uh, black has pretty much chosen what he wants to achieve with this move d6. And so now I'm asking you guys at home to try and identify what it is that black is actually playing for. And then once you've found that, try and find out how you can achieve it. How can you actually make it a reality here? Yes, not at home this week, back in the studio. Back in the studio. So there's a few different ideas. Smarth is saying the move bishop f5. Uh, Yashas is playing uh, the move c5. Anish also says c5. And yeah, c5 is definitely uh, one of the playable plans here for black. The idea is to expand, uh, or sorry, not expand, but to open up this diagonal for this bishop to make this uh, piece rather strong. However, due to the way that white has played, maybe he could consider playing c3 here, and this might be a very effective way of playing against this idea of c5, because as white has not committed this pawn to c4, going for these Benoni-style plans can be a little bit more difficult, right? This pawn on c3 does a great job of supporting this pawn, uh, 
on d4, and Magnus might be a little bit happy with this. Uh, the other plan that I wanted to mention is actually going for this move e5. This is sort of the most combative way to challenge this center, and I think this is sort of what Jan had in mind. Of course, there are some obvious uh, things preventing black from playing this move. For example, white is controlling this square three times, and it's going to be rather difficult to get this move into play. And that's probably how Jan arrived at this idea of knight h5. As for this bishop f5 move, I don't think it's a bad move by any means. It's just a good developing move. Uh, but why is it showing the threat? I'm not so sure. Uh, no, we're good to go, Ben. Thank you, though. It's showing the threat, which I used to know how to get rid of, but I just do not remember. Oh, well. You'll just see the threats that uh, Black is making. Mm -mm. So bishop f5, not a bad move at all, just a normal developing move. But it does allow white time to do something very, very important. And what that thing is, is preserving this bishop. Jan didn't want to give Magnus time to preserve this bishop, because this bishop is one of the main reasons why Black is not so comfortable playing this move e5 just yet. That's why the computer was so expertly highlighting the fact that knight h5 was the threat. So the question arises, why not play knight h5 now? And that's exactly what Jan chose to do. Uh, and here, Magnus found a really interesting idea that I was actually not familiar with until looking at this game. Uh, so generally, in these positions, knight h5 is a successful way to sort of corral this bishop. But who can find a way to potentially save this bishop from being captured? Who sees the deep idea that Magnus Carlsen came up with here to, uh, to save this bishop? Who has it here? Aha. Thank you to Chess King in the chat, solving my technical issues. Mm -mm. So Chess Space Arabia does have the idea here. It takes advantage of the fact that white has placed his pieces uh, in this manner with this light squared bishop on e2. He's very ready to make threats to this knight on h5. So immediately, if you try to threaten this knight, of course, it doesn't matter. The knight can capture the bishop. And if you play like this, you even lose a pawn to boot. But white does have this idea of repositioning this bishop first. Now, black must try to chase the bishop away if he does want to still take it. And only now, after h6 and g5, black has actually undefended this knight. And this allows white to play this idea of knight f to d2. And so here we see that uh, black is not having such an easy time uh, capturing this bishop. The move g takes h4 actually can be played, and it will be met with bishop takes h5. And if there are any Bobby Fischer fans in the chat, you may recognize this type of position from a certain world championship match where uh, we did have a slightly different scenario where White was able to capture on h5, and after g takes h5, uh, Fisher did get a similar pawn structure. But the same ideas sort of hold true here uh, that were true in, in that match. With this open g file, black is going to be able to exert a little bit of pressure here. And these pawns, while they look awful, actually aren't all that weak. The black king is going to be doing OK with this dark squared bishop around to protect it. Additionally, black now does have the time to break in the center with a move like e5. For example, takes takes, h3 to cement these pawns, and something like queen g5 would be quite interesting for black. Jan, though, was not so interested in going for these clever ideas. Another idea was actually to step to f4 with this knight, highlighting the fact that uh, you know, this bishop is still a problem that you have to solve. And here, if you save the dark squared bishop, you might end up losing the light squared bishop. And once again, these positions are always going to be very, very interesting. Uh, Jan, though, just backed down from the challenge. And I don't think this is something that black really should have done. Uh, 
uh, there are some scenarios uh, after bishop g3 where having included h6 and g5 is going to be beneficial for black in these positions. Uh, and that is because black is able to contest this f4 square. So for example, let's say if black passes and white plays the move e4, now all of a sudden it's going to be a little bit more difficult to play this move f4, and black is even going to have ideas of rerouting to this f4 square himself. Like let's say uh, black passes again and white plays another bad move, all of a sudden knight h5 and black is probably significantly better. So h6 g5 is sometimes a good idea for black in these Benoni, King's Indian type positions for the reason that it controls the f4 square and this can be quite useful for black. However, the key point here is that Magnus is not committed to this move e4 and that is going to be the idea that we see in this game. Because Magnus is not committed to e4, he is quite ready to contest this f4 square. And so h6 and g5 turn out to just be weakening moves for black in this case. And I think this is a great example of Magnus Carlsen just having fantastic chess understanding, whereas Jan maybe thought he could get away with something here, but not against the world champion when he's on form. So we'll see for the remainder of this game, Magnus' moves are quite directly aimed at taking advantage of this weakness of h6, g5. Meanwhile, Jan is really getting no advantage from having, uh, having played these moves. The extra space on the king's side is sort of meaningless because white is contesting all of those squares. Uh, and that's the really instructive lesson that I hope you guys can take away from this opening here. Uh, many Benoni players might know this idea of playing h6 and g5 as being good in some positions, but without the understanding of why, then you're just going to be led astray, and you're going to start playing it in positions where it doesn't actually make sense. And this is one of those positions where it doesn't make sense. h6, g5 gives you control of f4 and the opportunity to capture this bishop. In this case, those two things are irrelevant. The bishop is alive, and white can contest this square with the pawn on e3. Uh, okay, moving along, Jan now plays the move knight c6. Like I said, he is aiming to control the e5 square. Uh, and this is something that black has achieved by pushing this knight away from f3. The hold on e5 has been weakened slightly. And Magnus plays a, a pretty interesting move here. He develops this knight out to c3, rather than playing something like c4 or c3 himself. Uh, just bringing the knight out to c3. And I think the reason for this is because he realized that the fight for the d5 square isn't going to be very, very relevant uh, until a little bit later in the game. He would much rather have this pawn back on c2, able to come to c3 to stunt this bishop after the opening up of the diagonal, or even uh, to just stay on c2 to, to guard some squares in, later on. Notably on c4, it's also taking away squares from the white pieces, and we'll see that that becomes relevant later on as well. So just knight c3 is a way to develop and control the center without really committing to too much here. Uh, once again, as always, every move in chess comes sort of with a downside, especially pawn moves, and while c4 does gain some control of the center, it also gives up control of other squares. So we see Magnus opts not to go for it here, and Jan plays the natural move e5. Uh, d takes e5, knight takes e5, and now once again I'd like to ask you guys at home to try and find uh, Magnus's next move, or uh, just try to come up with a, a short-term plan to activate the white pieces. Uh, so Steve is asking why not bishop g4 for black. Up to this point, uh, white has had that square controlled just, just too many times. Now, now black could consider it because these two knights are here, but bishop g4 in the previous positions would, would just lose a piece. Chess king says knight e4 ideas, bringing uh, one of the knights to e4. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, Yashis is saying h4 or f4. And that's uh, along the right idea here. <clears throat> Chess base Arabia says bishop e5, d e5, and knight c4, followed by bishop f3. So I'm not so sure that uh, white can actually get away with this plan, but let's talk about some other plans first. Uh, knight e4 actually doesn't do a whole lot for white in this specific case. Uh, these ideas seem good to loosen black's control of d5, but c6, d5 are likely uh, ideas that black has already had in mind. And additionally, after takes and takes, the black bishop is just going to be opened up a little bit. And uh, it's going to be black who's coming a bit faster with stuff like d5. For example, if the knight retreats, c6. Black has good control and an open bishop. Uh, if you do want to take on e5, do you take c5, something like knight c4? This isn't really terrible for white, but something like queen e7. And after the move e4, the bishop pair is sort of the bishop pair here, right? Bishop e6 is going to follow, and we'll have the contested d file as well. And white doesn't have very, very clear pieces, or very, very square, square, very, very clear squares for his pieces. Took me a few tries. Uh, for example, if bishop f3, I'll immediately the move e4 is going to be an issue. So the idea, like I hinted at earlier, is to take advantage of these weaknesses that black has created. Uh, and so nobody in the chat actually mentioned the idea of e4. This is what I thought might uh, be natural to most players, but you can see here that black is sort of well set up against this idea, right? This h6, g5 pawn structure is aimed against the idea of playing with the extra space in the center. Now something like knight g6 is going to be very, very natural, and black can start to take over these dark squares on the king's side. So as Yashas kind of hinted at, I do really enjoy the idea of f4. And that is exactly what Magnus Carlsen plays in this position. I will say that perhaps he could have been a little bit more ready to play the move f4 with the move h3. h3 in the idea is quite simply to defend the g4 square so that after the idea of f4, there is no knight uh, landing on the g4 square. That being said, Magnus just plays it immediately and does allow black to step to this g4 square uh, himself. Now white has to deal with a problem. So he solves this problem with rook to f3. Uh, knight c4 was also definitely worth considering, but rook f3 is simple enough to defend the pawn. And now black simply plays the move rook e8, and white plays the move knight to f1. OK. Uh, so what do we have here now? Well, we have a, a pretty unorthodox looking position in the center, right? Neither side is occupying the center with a pawn just yet, but we do see them trying to kind of combat it from the sides or, or sort of from behind with the pawn on d6. Uh, and what this means is that the center is very, very open. And when the center is very, very open like this, sometimes pawns aren't enough to sort of control the center. Uh, when, the pawn, when the center is open and the pawns aren't there to control it, what I'm trying to get at is that this is when it's time to control the center using pieces. And that's what we'll, we'll see Magnus Carlsen does a great job of doing here. So some of black's best moves, for example, would be the slightly strange looking knight to h7. Why is this one of black's best moves? Well, because it's controlling the center with the pieces and preparing to control the center even more with an idea like f5 and ideas of c6 and d5, right? It's all about central control. Another idea for black is to simply capture on f4 to be able to, once again, better control the center with his pieces. Knight h5 to follow as well, and we'll see that it's black who is trying very, very hard to control these central squares. Now, in the game, Black plays knight h5, which has a similar idea of controlling the center. But unfortunately, after the move bishop e1, Jan does sort of go astray here. Uh, I think now is the time for black to take over in the center. So while there are some immediate threats 
uh, to the king's side, something like g takes f4, e takes f4, and then once again, uh, going for central control with a, with a move like c6, I think would have been very, very relevant here for black. The issue is, by playing this move knight h5, he's placed his pieces on slightly awkward squares, and he's going to have to deal with threats of h3. Uh, that being said, still other moves, queen e7, for example, and even dropping this knight back. No, this would be a bad idea, because this is going to be quite strong. Uh, ideas of queen e7 would still be fine for black, fighting against these ideas and following up with c6 and d5. In the game, though, after uh, bishop e1, black tried to solve these problems with the move f5. And f5 is an attempt to take over the e4 square. And so you might be thinking, well, what's wrong with that? And I'm going to ask you guys at home now to see if you can find uh, what White's idea should be here against the move f5. <clears throat> Great Wolf says, but what about the diagonal of death? Uh, I think he might be referring to the a2g8 diagonal which might be on the right track. So f5 was actually aimed against this idea of h3. Uh, now this knight is still going to come back, but black is contesting the g4 square and can likely consider ideas of g4. For example, rook f2, hitting the knight, and g4. This was the point of f5, because Jan was worried about this idea of h3 and still was fighting to control the center. So e4 is a pretty interesting one. I think the issue is not that it hangs the e4 pawn, uh, which you were offering us some tactical solutions, but f4 would be left behind. Once again, h6, g5, playing for control of f4. But in these positions, it is favorable for white, because white still has this pawn on e3. So yes, in fact, the idea for white here is to play bishop c4 check. Once again, controlling the center with the pieces rather than the pawns. Uh, and with bishop c4, if a move like king h8, then bishop f7, as someone mentioned, is a tactic. So if a move like king f8 instead, now quite simply, the move h3 is still going to be quite strong. Takes, takes. And something like rook f2. And the issue now for black is that if you try something like c6, You've weakened your king side a bit too much, and g4 is, is going to be coming through with pretty devastating effects. Uh, in fact, I think white is sort of just winning a piece here. So now life is pretty awkward for black. You have to try something like f4, but I can even still win this piece with the move bishop e2. Uh, due to all of these threats, instead of king f8, the move bishop e6 was played. The idea being takes, takes, h3, knight uh, g to f6. Now after fg5, hg5, uh, white can simply win a pawn on f5. This light squared bishop was too important for black, and now white goes up a pawn with a winning position. So what all went wrong for black? Well, tactically, uh, things went wrong because he put his pieces on loose squares. And positionally, things started going wrong once he played this move way back here, knight f6, allowing bishop g3, when all of a sudden, these pawns don't make the most sense in the world. It's what allowed Magnus to go for these interesting ideas of playing f4. And after these interesting positional uh, ideas by Magnus, Jan was unable to uh, deal with this pressure to the center, to the king's side, and that's what allowed Magnus to break through and win this game. Uh, let's look at the end of it, though, as well. Rook takes f5, and Jan chose the move uh, bishop h6. He needed to clear uh, this square away for the knight. g4 is played anyways. Knight back to g7, rook back to f3, and queen up to d7. But, you know, this is sort of just 
uh, sort of just awful now for black down a pawn, and none of his pieces really making sense. Uh, the play now for white is very natural. You bring the knight out to contest some of these squares that have been weakened by this pawn moving to g5. We have rook a to e8. And Magnus simply defends this pawn with bishop f2. We have queen c6. And finally, we see this pawn step to e4. Its job of controlling f4 has sort of been completed. Uh, there's no black knight immediately stepping to this square anymore. Knight d7 played in the game going for this dark square. But after knight d5, Jan had seen enough and simply resigned this game with uh, this awful, awful position on the board. Uh, one of those positions where white's not up mating material or anything, not up anything huge, but the position is just so bad that Jan could not bear to look at it anymore and resigned this game. Uh, play might have continued with something like rook f8, rook c3, this queen moves away takes on c7, for example, knight back to f6, and just, just anything here. Anything here is enough. Mm -mm. And white would now be up, uh, I guess still only two pawns, but it feels like so much more, with black having very, very limited counterplay. Uh, okay, so any questions about this game? Uh, I think I saw one a little bit earlier on asking why not uh, c5 playing for bishop d4 check. I'm not sure where you mean. Uh, another, oh, so you probably mean g takes f4 and something like c5. So getting rid of this pawn on e3 first. Uh, okay, and yeah, this idea is fine. You're still walking into the same issues of h3, right? And we have this square defended enough times. If you play the move knight e3, I can just capture. <clears throat> and something, oh, well, this guy, this guy would be hanging. Um, any other questions about this game? Don't think you should have resigned that early. Yeah, it was kind of an early resignation. I don't think it was out of respect. I think it was out of just uh, the psychological damage that would be done uh, trying to play that position out. Honestly, it is, it is quite dead lost. Mm -mm. Um, bishop takes e6, rook takes e6, queen d5. So yeah, queen d5 here I think would just mean, uh, mean queen e8. And there's no way to add more pressure to this rook immediately. Queen f7 would be coming soon, or something like c6, d5 to break this pin, and then black would be okay. I guess f5 is hanging, uh, but then, then e3 is hanging, and things would still be a game. Knight e3, rook e3, check, king h8. Life goes on, right? It's not over just yet. <laughs> Why didn't he play for e5 without trying to get rid of the bishop? Well, I think that's probably closer to what he uh, should have done here. Just something like rook e8, for example, knight bd7. Let's say he retreats. And can you play e5 yet? I think you can just play e5 already, if you so choose. This is a, a perfectly fine way of playing. Uh, I think Jan playing knight h5 did turn out to be a mistake. Uh, it probably would have been fine if he went for these more interesting lines of capturing on h4 or playing knight f4, but I just don't think it makes sense to put these pawns on h6 and g5 and then not go after this bishop. Um, okay, let's move on to the next game. Uh, once again, we're going to take a look at another game from this finals match between Magnus Carlsen and Jan Nepomniuszczy. In this game, Jan has the white pieces, and we're going to be looking at uh, an entirely different type of position. Uh, when Jan had white in this match, he went for some really crazy positions in the Nidorf. So let's take a look and see what we have going on here. Jan starts the game with the move e4. As I said, we do end up in the Nidorf, which Magnus has been playing a little bit of. Uh, he hasn't always been the biggest Nidorf player, but he's has been taking up the challenge lately. 
And in this game, Jan went for the move 6h3. And this is a rather fashionable way of playing these days. Uh, the idea, of course, is to go for an early g4 and try to checkmate white. Uh, in the game, Magnus goes for the move e5. Knight b3 was white's choice. Notably, in, in general here, knight d e2 is a much more common idea for white. Why is knight d e2 much more common? Well, because after the move g4, white's going to place this knight on g3, and uh, knights work very, very well behind pawns like this. They start fighting for the same squares. But knight b3 certainly isn't a bad move. Uh, what's the advantage of knight, uh, knight b3? Well, for one, you're opening up this bishop, right? And against knight d to e2, these days black is almost exclusively playing the move h5 which does make g4 a little bit harder to achieve, which makes this knight on e2 look a little bit uh, sillier. Whereas after knight b3, if black plays the move h5, now all of a sudden, with this bishop being opened up, there are some very strong ideas of going for control of the d5 square. For example, bishop g5, uh, something like bishop e7 might be played, and you could even consider capturing this guy and going something like bishop c4, just fighting for the immediate control of, of the d5 square. These ideas are sort of available to white now, whereas they really wouldn't be with this knight on e2. In the game, Magnus chose not to allow this sort of thing, instead playing the move bishop e7. The upside to bishop e7 is it's developing the pieces more quickly, playing against these ideas of bishop g5 or other ideas of early bishop development by white. The downside, of course, as you may have guessed, is that it's not the move h5, which means the move g4 is going to come on the board, as it did in this game. Uh, now it really would be a bit too much for black to allow this pawn to g5, when white would very, very quickly start taking over the king's side, and without this knight on f6, uh, black is missing a key defender of the d5 square, as well as some other important squares on the, queen, on the king's side. So, in the game, Magnus plays the move h6, contesting the g5 square. Bishop e3 is natural development by white. Knight bd7 now, very natural by black as well. And now the move a4 is usually a good idea for white in these positions, just to slow down any potential plans of b5 and b4 to gain this space on the queen side and kick this knight out of the c3 square, where it threatens to come to d5 and controls the e4 pawn. Uh, now, Magnus plays a pretty interesting move here. It might not be one that would be natural to you at first glance, but the idea behind it makes a lot of sense. So that idea is to play the move knight to f8. Uh, so what is knight f8? Well, knight f8 is an attempt to reroute this knight, not actually to e6 in most cases, but instead over to g6. And on g6, this knight does a lot of really good things for black's position. Uh, position. One, it controls a very important f4 square. If white was able to play something like f4 and f5, then things would start to, uh, to look pretty dire for black on the king's side, uh, with so much space being taken by these pawns. A lot of the time, white can also threaten to take on e5 as well, after this idea of f4. But from g6, black is doing a great job of controlling this square. Uh, also very, very relevant is it does indirectly sort of uh, try and discourage the move h4. Uh, black is going to be able to plant this knight on h4 in some cases to prevent the move h4 from, uh, from happening. Now, bishop c4 is white's idea. Once again, this is sort of the advantage to putting this knight on b3 rather than on e2, because bishop is open. And Magnus follows up with the natural, the natural move, knight g6. Uh, oops. <laughs> okay, I do want to mention that uh, a mistake for black would likely be castling in this position. This is probably being a bit too kind to white castling into this attack uh, with sort of no, no resistance. Uh, in general, in the Nydorf and many other openings where white is launching an early attack on the king's side, you can look at some French lines, for example, uh, 
it can be good to delay castling the king until you're a little bit more prepared, either to deal with the attack or until white's focus has shifted to attacking the king somewhere else. Uh, so that's why we see knight f8, knight g6. Uh, Jan chooses the move queen e2 now, uh, with the idea of keeping an eye on these two things and clearing the way for queenside castles. Uh, queen e2 does the other great job of indirectly defending the e4 pawn if this knight ever wants to move. And Magnus simply plays the move bishop d7. Once again, at this point, probably castles would be a playable idea for black because he's added this additional defender to the king's side. But still, bishop d7, delaying castles for as long as possible because he still isn't sure if the king is going to be safer over there or in the center. Uh, now we see the move f3. And so I'd like you guys at home to tell me what the move f3 uh, signifies. Why? Has black or why has white played the move f3? Why f3? So Mateo actually has the right idea here. Uh, Muhammad says to play knight d5, that's actually not so much going to be the case here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Black's next move was rook c8, which we'll talk about in a bit. But knight d5 isn't going to be the best idea here. Black is actually very, very happy to trade off the f6 knight for the c3 knight because it opens up this bishop and allows him to defend these dark squares on the king's side so much more easily than he would otherwise. Uh, so Matteo, uh, his idea was f3 is to play h4 and h5, which of course is correct. Can't do it right now because this guy is hanging, but after f3, this does become a threat. So how do you want to respond to this idea of playing h4? We, we have sort of done half the battle here. We know what our opponent wants to do. He's telling us with the move f3. He wants to play the move h4. And now we get a move to decide what's the best way for us to respond to this idea of h4. What's the best way for us to respond? So Chess King says the move knight h7. And this is the move that I would be very, very tempted to play if I had the black pieces in this position. It's the most direct idea. It's directly challenging the h4 pawn. Our opponent likely isn't going to want to play this as a sacrifice. And it's true that this move might be OK for, uh, for black here. The problem is that white could simply uh, queenside castle and now our knight isn't really doing anything uh, proactive on the h7 square. It's, it's a good defender of the king side, but we can actually see that white has done a great job of maintaining a little bit of flexibility in his position. It's true that he was aiming for this king side attack with, where he opens everything up, but also he's placed his pieces very well for an attack in the center of the board. And this is something that black has to keep in mind. Uh, so, for that reason, uh, I don't believe Magnus really wanted to play the move knight h7. Instead, he came up with a much more interesting way of dealing with this idea of h4. And that uh, method was to play this move rook c8. Now, after the idea of h4, Magnus is very ready to meet it with the idea of knight h7, h5, and knight h4. Uh, sorry, not knight h4, but bishop h4 check. So the idea now is that after, for example, the exchange sacrifice, uh, white has to solve the issue of this rook bearing down on the c-file and specifically attacking this bishop on c4. Uh, in the game, Jan actually castles queenside, which I do think is a pretty significant mistake because now knight takes f3 is coming on the board, and the exchange sacrifice for white no longer makes that much sense. Uh, 
uh, just to explain a little bit more deeply, uh, white goes for this exchange sacrifice because now, of course, this knight is sort of entirely trapped on the h4 square. Uh, but Magnus, seeing this coming from a distance, had already placed this rook on c8 to be able to challenge uh, white's, uh, white's hold on this knight by threatening stuff like knight takes f3 or even knight g2 to reroute, using the fact that this bishop is loose on c4. So this is the type of multi-purpose move that uh, is really making Magnus uh, so good at chess, right? It's easy to see that white is threatening h4. It's very, very difficult to come up with rook c8 in response to h4, right? You know h4 is coming. You know rook c8 is generally you know, a positive move that you would like to play. But then to find this justification for it by playing bishop h4 check and shoving this knight onto the h4 square, that is very, very impressive to, to my mind. Uh, so what should you take away from this? Well, we kind of know some useful moves for black here. Our, one of them is definitely going to be playing the move rook c8. It's just an active square for the rook. It pressures the bishop. It pressures the king after queenside castles. And so you should always still consider these useful moves uh, even when you think your opponent is making a pretty significant threat. So we know that h4 seems like a significant threat, but you definitely want to at least consider playing the move rook c8, right? Rook c8 is a move that you would like to play, so it's worth it to spend some time and try to figure out, is rook c8 a move that I can play? Am I going to be happy with what happens to the position after rook c8? And so Magnus had asked himself this question. He didn't give up on this move too early, and then he ended up coming up with this really nice idea of bishop h4 check, takes takes, and knight takes f3. And from this point forward, Magnus had a pretty good control over this game. Uh, just to mention, the move, a move like king f1 actually would be playable here for whites. But now the downside is, of course, queenside castles is no longer legal. That's the main downside. And black is able to play something like knight f4, takes takes. And let's just uh, play a move, for example something like bishop back to f6. And while white is definitely still coming up with some threats here, uh, he's not exactly checkmating on the king side. It's very difficult to break through with this pawn structure and black having good, good control. And without the dark squared bishop, this dark squared bishop is going to be pretty powerful now for black on this wide open diagonal. Definitely would have been an interesting game, but Jan chose to go for queen side castles instead here. Uh, which does end up uh, with a worse position. I will say that white likely had to go for a move like bishop d5. Uh, and the point of bishop d5, of course, is to renew this trap of the knight on h4. But now the issue for white is sort of there's no comfortable way to actually capture this piece. Uh, for example, bishop d5 is attacking this pawn on b7 if rook b8. The, the question arises, how do you add enough attackers to this knight to actually be able to capture it one day? And uh, I have no idea, to be honest with you. Uh, play might continue with something like queenside castles, uh, even kingside castles now for white or for black. Queen f2 to threaten this knight, but after something like b5, rook h1, b4, for example, knight takes f3, queen takes f3. Uh, we end up with an interesting type of position where white has spent so much time to collect this knight. And it's not a full piece that white is up. It's two pieces for a rook. And in exchange, black already even has the extra pawn and some nice play on the queen side to, uh, to go along with it. So would have just been an interesting game from this point forward. Instead, though, we do see Jan queenside castle first, allowing knight takes f3, as I've said. Uh, Jan's idea was to capture back on d6, but now the move queen e7 is very natural, trying to evict this rook and take control of some more squares. Uh, the rook comes over to b6, but now bishop takes g4, and the entire king side is just collapsing now for white. Uh, after the move bishop d5, threatening b7, 
Uh, black simply takes the opportunity to castle. Of course, white is now breaking through in the center, and black has very much taken control of the king's side, winning all of the king's side pawns. So now black is much happier to castle the king king's side than leave it in this opening center. Uh, and from here, Jan could have sort of stayed in the game with a fight, trying to take all of the queen's side pawns. For example, rook b8, queen takes a6. And black would probably retreat to the center, uh, trying to take more control over some of the queen side, because this is where white's idea, or white's play, white's ideas are going to take place now. And it would have been an interesting game. Uh, what, black, for the moment, is up the exchange for a single pawn, but white has these three connected pawns on the queen side and definitely has some play. Uh, in the game, though, after kingside castles, white went with queen g2. And this is sort of the wrong idea here. Jan is still trying to make this uh, kingside attack work, but with these two pawns missing, while it does open some files for white, it also removes some key attackers, right? These pawns are going to be tough to break without these uh, white pawns on the king's side to control some squares. Uh, queen h4 is black's response, just defending the bishop and not allowing any tactics. Now rook g6 was Jan's clever idea, taking advantage of this pin. But black doesn't have to try too hard to refute this, simply knight h to g5. Knight f6 would have been fine. This knight would have been fine. Any move that doesn't hang the bishop, uh, or move the bishop, of course. And now black is just totally winning. Uh, King b1 played in the game. Of course, queen e1 was a little bit of a threat. And just bishop back to e6 now. We have, if bishop takes e6, then f takes e6 likely would have been the response. Uh, there's also ideas of queen e1 check but we'll just start with f takes e6. And in the game, Jan decided he would rather actually have the bishop than the rook here. So rook takes e6 played in the game, f e6, and now bishop takes b7. But white is down two exchanges now. And after the move queen e1, king, or sorry, bishop c1, not king a2. Rook takes c3, Magnus gives back an exchange in order to get a crushing advantage on, on the queen side. And once again, this game is, is sort of just over. Bishop takes e4, queen e4. Uh, white does get to capture on h6. Rook f7 defends against the mate. The bishop comes back. Queen f5. And playing through these last moves a little bit more quickly. Nothing too exciting happens here. Black, just up the exchange, has a very easy position. The a pawn falls. And at the end of the day, We're arriving at the end of the day, waiting for me to finish my sentence. Rooks are worth more than knights at the end of the day, is how that sentence ends, with no more checks and the extra material for Magnus. Well, I did not realize just how many moves this game goes on, but this is all endgame technique, which is boring. And white ends up actually checkmated on the king's side of the board. I know I played through those uh, end moves very, very quickly, but I didn't want to spend too, too much time on them as black was just totally winning with the extra rook. If you are interested in these types of end games, I recommend checking out the end game class. I'm not going over this end game in particular, but I do go over some very interesting end games like these. The crux of this game really ends up being this move rook c8, I think. I think this is sort of the clever idea by Magnus that sort of uh, started leading Jan uh, into the, the what's, what's the quote? Into the dark forest wh where the path out is, is only wide enough for one. And it was wide enough for Magnus, not wide enough for Jan in these ensuing complications. Very, very clever idea to use this rook to uh, play against these pawns on the king's side. Uh, okay, we have time, I think, to go over one more game quickly. I wanted to go over one of Jan's wins. In fact, Jan's only win in the match. It was a fun game, also in the Nidorf. So I'm going to go through it rather quickly. We probably don't have enough time to go into all the complications, but it is worth taking a look at. So in this one, like I said, Jan has the white pieces, and we are back in the Nidorf. And Jan goes for the move rook g1. Uh, 
And I don't know if this is the official name of the variation, but on Lee Chess, where I'm giving this lecture, uh, it is listed as Freak Attack. This is the Nidorf variation, Freak Attack. So one to keep in mind, for sure. Uh, and the reason I think this move isn't as popular, it's going for this idea of g4 all the same, but it is a bit more committal than this move h3. Uh, for example, if black plays the move b5 against h3, ideas of knight d5 are sort of available to white. Ideas of g4 as well. And if bishop b7, going for these threats, bishop g2. And this is available to white to control the e4 pawn, where if you compare with rook g1, b5, g4, bishop b7, all of a sudden bishop g2 is a little bit less easy to, uh, to play when you're interfering with your own pieces' uh, control of the g-pawn and support of pushing the g-pawn forward. Uh, this is still playable for white and has been played before, but Jan's idea here was not to go for this because honestly, this position is very much just a worse version for white of the position with the rook on h1 and the pawn on h3. So Jan justifies his opening by playing the move g5. And this one is sort of a, sort of a wild one. Uh, this is, in fact, a pawn sacrifice by Jan, and this is the second time he played this move in the match. The first time he played this move, Magnus Carlsen played the move knight f to d7 and actually went on to win the game. Uh, since that game, I think Magnus probably booked up a bit and followed through with the move knight takes e4 instead, accepting this sacrifice. And from here, we see Jan play some very, very interesting chess. We have knight takes e4, bishop takes e4, and now the move a4 is the novelty that Jan brought, uh, brings to the table. This position had been seen before, actually uh, a number of times, but queen g4 had been played every time this, this appeared. Now, on this time around, we get a4 by Jan. Uh, and black has a couple of options here. Perhaps the simplest is to play the move b4, when after white tries to challenge this bishop, black can play the move d5 and try and take over the center. Uh, this is why sacrificing the e-pawn is so dangerous, because if your opponent gets just a little bit of extra time, then they're going to be able to take over the center, and once they get control of the center, it's going to be very difficult to, uh, to challenge, uh, challenge them anywhere. Instead, though, Magnus plays the move e5, which is sort of an attempt to get a better version of playing the move b4. For example, if this knight goes away to some place like b3, now black's options uh, include taking on a4, for example, bringing this bishop back to c6, and once again, just sort of taking over the entire center. Rook a5 would be a, you know, a legal chess move, bishop b7, castles, and black is doing very, very, very well here. Uh, instead of all this, though, we now see the true nature of Jan's idea, and that is to take on b5. He says, go ahead, capture my knight. And this is actually a, a pretty good peace sacrifice by Jan here. Uh, it's not the type of sacrifice where Jan is immediately regaining uh, his entire piece, but it is giving him some very, very active play. Uh, for example, if e takes d4, queen takes d4, is hitting this bishop, you don't want to do something like bishop back to b7, because now the killer move might not be what you uh, would first think of, but it's to activate the rook on g1 with the move rook g3, coming to e3 with some killer ideas. And the main issue here for black is that the move bishop e7, while very desirable, is not so easy to obtain due to this pressure on g7. Uh, that being said, the move d5 would likely be holding a quality for black with the idea of knight d7 and giving up this piece, this pawn after all, to follow. Uh, when black's position is very, very compact, and this bishop on e4 does a great job of sort of stunting the pressure uh, that this rook on e3 can provide. 
If something like f3 as well, then you're sort of asking for a little bit of trouble around your own king, something like bishop takes c2. And this king is sort of lacking squares to, uh, to run to, lacking some squares. Uh, in the game, though, we saw none of that. Instead, we see bishop e7 by Magnus Carlsen, perhaps not ready to accept this peace sacrifice when things would be uh, uh, rather crazy, rather crazy for him. So bishop e7 instead. We see the move rook g4 now by Jan, once again activating this rook along the g file, showing the point to his early opening play. And after a takes b5, Jan now does not capture on e4 because this guy is hanging. And he doesn't take on a8 because that would solve black's problems. So instead, we see the move bishop b5 check, knight d7, and bishop d2, sort of uh, keeping the tension everywhere. Uh, and now, unfortunately, I do think, unfortunately for Magnus, that is, Jan actually does have a little bit of an edge in this position. Turns out here, the move king f8 uh, sort of had to be played, and you can kind of understand why this is. Uh, the point now is that if white ever gets this pressure, for example, rook takes e4, sorry, we're still hanging this piece. For example, bishop d2, rook takes, queen takes, something like d5, knight e2. Uh, the point is white's pressure on g7 is really going to be alleviated before it ever exists. Uh, there's never going to be any issues of queen takes g7 with the king on f8. Of course, black still has problems to solve here. Uh, namely, he's very underdeveloped in exchange for just one pawn, but it is more or less equality. After knight d7, the issue now is that the e-file could open at any moment. This diagonal is already open, and that leaves the king squarely on the intersection of two very dangerous lines. Uh, bishop d2 played in the game. This bishop comes back to b7, and now knight f5 is sort of the, the killer blow here. Uh, Magnus thought he could castle to avoid a hassle, but it turns out the hassle was following him anyways. And so White already is able to win the game with his next move. So White to move and win, and then I will show you what Jan played in the game, which might also win, although it is in a little bit of a less obvious manner. So White to move and win. <clears throat> And I'm noticing we're running out of time, so I'm going to reveal the answer now. Pause if you don't want it spoiled for you. White to move and win, the move rook g to a4 is actually the idea. And this is a highly counterintuitive move. The reason this move is winning is it because it turns out black's seventh rank is simply too weak in, in this case. You always see ideas of the rook coming to the seventh and being very powerful and capturing pawns. In this case, you're going to end up with the rook coming to the seventh and being very powerful, capturing full pieces. Uh, for example, if rook takes a4, rook takes a4, bishop takes g5 isn't enough because bishop g5, queen g5, bishop d7 is winning a full piece. And so there's simply no way to deal with all the threats. Rook e8 means rook a7 when you see this rook just coming through with devastating effect. Bishop c8 bishop a5 now, and this guy is, is just too stuck. Knight b6 would be playable, but this is hanging, this is hanging, this is hanging. Too much for black. So rook g a4 was missed in the game. Instead, rook takes a8, bishop takes a8, and Jan is winning anyways, but with an attack on the king's side rather than this attack along the seventh rank. So rook h4, g6 is Magnus Carlsen's idea, but now queen g4 is very clever by Jan. Uh, the point being, if you capture this guy, queen h5 is forced, checkmate. And Jan is threatening to go queen h3 as well. We see knight c5. And now Jan actually misses the only move to win. The only move to win in this position is very, very incredibly the move king f1, which probably makes no sense to you. Didn't make any sense to me either, but it's the move that Stockfish finds to win the game. Uh, I'll tell you why in just a moment, but let's see the game continuation first. Queen h3 was played in the game. 
Magnus tries the move h5 to keep, th keep things closed, but any attacking player will tell you the answer here. Sacrifice this rook. You don't need that guy. Takes, takes, knight e6, and Magnus resigned before Jan could play a move. g6 to follow, and this is just devastating. For example here, free stuff, rook f7, free stuff, king h8, checkmate, all going quite well for white. So, what was the magical draw for black after queen h3? Why doesn't this move win? Well, it turns out bishop g5 is enough for a perpetual check. Bishop d2, king d2, queen g5, king c3, knight e4, king b4, g takes f5, check, check, take the rook, queen d2, and white is uh, getting perpetual checked, believe it or not. And so this is why king f1 was the only move to win, because then bishop takes d2 would not come with check. Here, if you play king f1, by the way, just the simple captures. And this is not checkmate, as the queen cannot step to h6. OK, very fun game between Jan and Magnus to end the lecture on. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed this. Uh, once again, that's the only game that Jan won in the two mini matches played between Magnus and Jan in the finals. Magnus with a truly dominating performance, proving that he is, in fact, a chess legend. Uh, if you're watching live, be sure to stick around. We're going to have a couple more classes tonight. Uh, up next is the end game class, still right here on YouTube. I'm going to be going over some end games to decide the next World Championship challenger. That is, of course, end games from this year's uh, candidates tournament, or at least the first half of it. Uh, with all that in mind, thank you so much for joining me this week on the Road to 2000. My name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.